what I want to do is, um, yeah, I, I called this talk All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace, because that's the title of the poem from back in the hippie shit days, 1967, I think, when uh, Caltech in California, California Institute of Technology, had a poet in residence, um, Richard Brautigan uh -huh. was his name, and he wrote this poem about a, a cybernetic utopia where um, people and machines would live in perfect harmony and uh, would all, uh, the people would help the machine, would create the machines and the machines would help the people live more full and beautiful and relaxed lives and it's all, if I look around, around myself in the technology scene, that's not quite what I see. Um, so, hence that. So, what I'd like to do is start by talking about computers <coughs> and then move up the stack. Make, after the computers, we'll talk about networks and then we'll talk about society and power and control and stuff that really matters. Computers are the cells of our civilization, of our modern digital civilization, and networks are the connective tissue between them. And both the cells and the tissue are evolving rapidly, and if any biologists in the audience complain about the metaphor, then we can talk about it over lunch. Um, computers today are simply everywhere. How many computers do you own? Um, three? Who has three computers? Three only? Or more? <laughs> <laughs> you know what happened when I gave this talk earlier this week in LinuxCon Europe? I started by asking how many software developers are in the room, and someone came back to me and said, what do you mean by software developer? No, you are a software developer. Uh, and then I have the same problem. So three or more? Good. Five? Seven? Ten? I'm uh, getting a bit thin there. Um, thank you. So I, I counted for myself. And I found that I own, I probably forgot some, but I, I own at least 17 computers. Wow. And that is not because I'm running a data center at home, but my wife sometimes claims I do. Um, yes, I do have a desktop and a laptop and the usual pile of old and crafty laptops in, and, and mobile phones in various states of decay. Um, but I also have a router, and I have a digital alarm clock, and we have a car, and a, a freezer that makes an annoying beep when I leave the door open for too long. And all these things, are computers, and um, all these computers are general purpose machines. They can perform, in theory, given enough time, electricity, they can perform any task accessible to logic, basically. Um, and what turns, what gives them the specific function of being an in-vehicle, no, it's not an entertainment, in-vehicle entertainment system, the car is like 13 years old, uh, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> I think it probably controls the air conditioning or something. So uh, what gives them their specific function of um, beeping when I leave the door open for too long or routing my packets on the internet or um, waking me up in the morning when my kids don't do that is um, it's just software that makes them do that, right? The software takes a general purpose computer and turns it into an appliance. Uh, that's the same thing what happens when you take your laptop and you fire up LibreOffice and then your computer basically turns into a typewriter for the time being, and when you're done, you turn it off and then you're back to a general purpose machine. Uh, you turn off LibreOffice, I mean. Um, it's just with, that with these other devices I mentioned, the, the, the restriction is permanent. So um, over the past couple of decades, we've seen a huge change. If we just like look at the last 20 years, in terms of the time and the cost of sending information around the world. Um, it's become, it used to be very, very expensive to get information from, say, Sweden to Australia. And today, when we send an email, we don't even care where it goes in particular because the cost is all the same, it's all legible. Um, and we also have access to unprecedented amounts of knowledge. So there are two personal stories I can share that can illustrate the point. The first one about the cost of being connected is that um, I went on a, on a high school exchange in the mid-90s. In 1994, I went from Germany, where I'm born and raised, to Minnesota in the United States. And 
uh, to spend 10 months there. And there was this girl I was seeing in Germany. And um, it was not feasible to talk on the phone even occasionally. The one, but what she did was when Christmas time came, the one thing she asked her parents for was a, a half hour phone call with me. That was so expensive at the time that she had to make it her only Christmas gift. Right? Um, I mean, by the time Christmas came, we had basically broken up, so that didn't go so well. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that makes it somehow even sadder. And the other thing is the amount of knowledge that we have access to. Uh, and for me, it's interesting to remember for myself how I lived through this transition, uh, through this huge jump in, in quality where I would start university in 1999. And it was a small town, it was a small university with a correspondingly small library. And when I wanted to learn about a new subject, I would, have, of course, pay for the library. But where that library's shelves ended was basically where my knowledge ended. And yes, then, once I'd been through all the stuff, through all like the five particular books they had on my subject, <coughs> then uh, I could get on the train and go to the next city next big city, Hamburg in that case, and find, try to find an, an, a strange institute on an unfamiliar campus and negotiate with a grumpy librarian about getting a particular book that I needed. Or I could get one into a library loan, which would take a week or two. Um, some people might still remember those days. Who does? Who's ever taken an inter book and interlibrary loan? That's not so bad, okay. Um, and, when was okay? When was the last time you did that? <laughs> how do you how do you signal that with a hand? <laughs> <laughs> like this decade? I, I mean, the, the the in the 2000s or last millennium? Last millennium. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I thought, right? Nobody does that anymore. Um, so I guess it's fair to talk about an evolutionary leap in the way our digital civilization works and. Um, this evolutionary leap has been possible due to two basic ingredients. The general purpose computer, the machine that can do anything as long as you give it the right software, um, and the general purpose network, the neutral network, the network that doesn't care what you send through, because all the, all the interesting stuff happens at the ends of the network, right? Um, now, these powerful tools that we have in, in the general purpose computer, in the general purpose neutral network, um, they are under threat, and she has described this this morning in detail, uh, they are under threat of being taken away from us uh, from, by those who see profit in controlling us, corporations, companies, and by governments who have a natural interest in controlling us. Um, so we get to the question of, we have these, with our smartphones, we have these powerful computers in our pocket, in our bags, in our homes, what can we really do with them in the end? Is there, what do they let us do? What are the limits? And what happens when you hit those limits? Um, because a lot of companies especially see profit in turning our computer, in, by in turning our computers into appliances, into things that just do one or two things. And um, you know, the only way, uh, to do that, um, to follow Cory Doctorow's argument, which I recommend you do, you go and read his stuff, is uh, to load them with spyware, with software that is controlled by someone other than you as the owner of the device. Um, and it can report back, it can just lock the device down, it can ask for authorization, it can do all these things, but in the end it's just spyware. It doesn't belong, it means the device doesn't really belong to you. And that often comes out of a desire to, by the, on the company's part, to, to offer a particular product that doesn't interfere with its business model. So you get these incredible smartphones and you want to sell them, and you, you create these incredible smartphones and you want to sell them. And then uh, marketing comes along and says, yeah, but uh, you know we have to sell these to the network operators, and they hate this voice over IP thing. Can, can we turn off this voice over IP thing on the phone? Yeah, sure we can, no problem, we'll just block that. Um, and at that point, the phone is no longer a general purpose computer. It's been castrated. It's been broken. It's been turned into an appliance that does many things, but not everything. And um, 
So that, that, that is a danger because the only thing, or what, what made the evolutionary leaps of the past two decades possible was always that we could take computers and we could take networks and make them do something that they weren't meant to do, that nobody had thought of when they were created. For example, when in 1974, uh, Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn created the Transmission Control Protocol, TCP, they did not think of the World Wide Web. They had no idea what it would be or that it would even be possible. But they built the protocol in a way that made the World Wide Web possible. And when Tim Berners-Lee in the early 1990s created the World Wide Web, he didn't think of Wikipedia, but he built the World Wide Web in a way that made Wikipedia possible. And um, so that means the real test of whether a particular device or a particular network that we're looking at enables our freedom is this one question. Can we make it do something that its makers did not intend it to do? The problem is not so much if, that if you, could, if you personally buy a device and you spend a lot of money on it and then it doesn't do this one particular thing like make voice over IP calls that you would love it to do, um, then that's annoying to you. That's, but that's not the problem. The problem is that um, every time we're restricting computers and every time we're restricting networks, we're wasting potential. We're just throwing it out the window. Because maybe that particular person who bought this restricted device could have done great things with the general purpose computer. And maybe they just got frustrated in the early stage and gave up because the device wouldn't let them do this stuff. And then they went on and studied performing arts and never became a programmer and never created that one application that would have um, enabled the analysis of, uh, I don't know, the HIV virus or um, that would have in some way uh, eradicated rural poverty, something of the sort, right? Um, and this waste of potential is simply not something we can afford in a world where people die of hunger every day in their thousands. And it's not something we can afford in a world where people die of preventable diseases in their thousands every day. We can't allow that, it's immoral. It's also bad for the economy, but it's mainly immoral. And, um, so we have these good ideas. We have computers and networks, and they can do all these wonderful things, but we need tools to put our ideas into practice because we don't want to start from zero every time. So free software provides these tools. Um, we can, you already know this, we can, you can just take free software and use it and adapt it for your purposes. It saves you a whole lot of time, except when you get to that one particular niggly bit that uh, you never can quite bring under control, then you spend a lot of time adapting. But in the end, you probably save 90% of the time. Uh, it also makes you part of a community. It means you don't work alone. It means you work across all the boundaries that in the free software community we no longer acknowledge of country and of language and of, of corporation or company. And um, it's also, incidentally, free software is the most powerful learning environment for technology that we've ever had. It's a community where you, that you get into, and um, you always find someone who does a particular thing better than you. And you can ask this person to teach you, and usually she does, and even if it's just by giving you the right manual to read and hitting you over the head with it. And um, then you, in turn, become an expert yourself, and you can go and teach others. So that is, and we know this from, from research, that um, that is one huge benefit of uh, people being involved in the free software community. And the whole point is that free software lets us master and control technology instead of letting the technology control us, instead of letting the technology be our master. But for how much longer can we actually install free software in our devices? <laughs> Matthias this morning um, mentioned the UE UEFI, Wi-Fi, sounds too much like Wi-Fi in German. Um, UEFI's secure boot, restricted boot thing. That basically, I'll briefly explain what it is. It's um, since about two weeks, devices are shipping that have this enabled. Um, UEFI is simply the successor to BIOS. 
the, the little set of software that starts when you turn on, when you power on the computer. And then that, in turn, loads a bootloader, and then that bootloader goes and loads your operating system. And um, someone at Microsoft thought that, hey, it would be kind of cool to make sure that the, the next version of BIOS, UEFI, uh, checks whether, this, whether the bootloader it's going to load is authorized. Decide whether that's the right bootloader, whether it's been compromised, perhaps. And so they call this secure boot, and they sell it on the security point that, um, well, if some, some malware has been messing with your operating system, then it simply won't boot at that time, and you'll know. Um, but we call it restricted boot, because what it's really meant to do is to make sure that nothing besides Microsoft Windows gets on that box. And, um, <coughs> the, in, in, the, in the specifications, which are the specifications that Microsoft issues, the private arbitrary rules, are the rules that um, the, the original equipment manufacturers, the OEMs, have to follow if, for, if they want the Windows 8 sticker for their boxes. With, and you don't sell many boxes without that sticker, so you need that. So they follow these rules, and for x86 platforms, the rules say, you can make it possible to turn off the secure boot thing, but that requires people to dive into their UEFI, formerly BIOS, settings, and in an unfamiliar environment do strange things and turn off something that says secure. And that is not something that a lot of people will voluntarily do. Um, on the ARM platform, it's even worse. On the ARM platform, uh, the specifications say you can't turn, make, it, make it possible to turn that off. It has to be on. And the, the consumer, the user, never gets to turn that off. So um, if you buy, uh, if, if, you, if you consider that the ARM platform is what goes into mobile devices, and that's where all the growth is, it means we'll have, soon have millions and billions of artificially restricted appliances on the market that could have been wonderful computers. And that is a huge waste of potential. And if, if you come across such a device, no matter how much you pay for it, you will never own it. It'll never be yours to control and change and play with. It's all going to be some kind of kindergarten, much like the iPhone, which is basically Apple's implementation of Saudi Arabia in terms of <laughs> not, letting you, <laughs> not letting all the interesting things on the App Store. Um, so again, the real test of general purpose computing is, can I make this do something that it wasn't meant to do? Um, there's DRM, of course, which is kind of the same as UEFI, only a lot more stupid in the, in the, in the implementation sense, not as an idea, as, a, as an idea is perhaps equally stupid. Um, in the implementation sense, it's not as smart as UEFI, but it serves, or as uh, restricted boo, but it serves the same purpose, because it's basically it turns your stuff into appliances, it locks you in, it installs spyware on your devices. And um, recently, a few weeks ago, um, someone obtained a patent on DRM technology for a 3D printer, or on DRM system for a 3D printer. <coughs> and it works very much like uh, restrictions management on, on, on digital or on software, or on movies, digital content, where um, you send a file to the 3D printer, and the 3D printer consults a server uh, and sends the file hash, and the server says, yes, this hash has been authorized for this particular user, and if you don't print it, and, or it hasn't been authorized, then you can't print it. Um, so that, is, it's not very imaginative, but if you consider that 3D printers are about to revolutionize manufacturing, and maybe not totally replace it, but do some pretty amazing things uh, or bro broaden our capability of creating stuff in some pretty amazing ways, then this clearly is a threat. What's an even bigger threat, perhaps, is the company that obtained this patent. Who has heard of intellectual ventures? Okay, a lot more people than I usually get. You don't count. <laughs> um, so Intellectual Ventures is a company created by the former uh, Microsoft Chief Technology Officer, Nathan Merbold. Um, oh, by the way, did I mention that the, the, the company doing the authorizing of keys on, on secure boot or restricted boot is Microsoft? 
<laughs> that probably was a good point to me. Anyway, so uh, Intellectual Ventures, uh, founded by Nathan Merbel from Microsoft CTO. And what they basically do is buy up as many patents as they can get. And calling them a patent troll would be an enormous understatement. The patent troll is a company that owns a few dozen patents and goes around annoying the hell out of people <coughs> on a particular small set of patents. Intellectual ventures is something else, and the best word we have for it so far is mass aggregator. It's been proposed by researchers rather than activists, so we may, maybe can, we can think of a better term. But they've amassed tens of thousands of patents so far. They go to universities in developing countries and say, do you want some money? Sign this contract. And the contract says, everything that gets invented and patented here, um, intellectual ventures gets to buy that for the next five or 10 years. And um, so they create this <laughs> huge pool of patents for all areas, and they license that out to a bunch of people. Um, they sue other, pe other companies through a lot of shell companies. The researchers in this particular paper is called The Giants Among Us. Um, identified something like 3,000 shell companies, but we're pretty sure they hadn't found everything by far. And um, yeah, they just go around shaping down honest businesses over patents. What they're basically doing is creating, their, their portfolio is so broad, they're basically creating a monopoly on innovation. So you were trying to tell me something? Ed? Yeah, I'm just uh, wondering how does that work, like if a pupil who's not like employed of the university, how does that work? Do, can they actually take that pupil's invention? Uh, we'll that talk be... about that later. I don't, I don't know in great detail, but let's talk about it later. Yeah, okay? all right, sure, no um, So intellectual ventures and companies like it, others exist, prevent, uh, presents a powerful threat to what we do. But what we do is innovate, and create, and make the world a better place. <laughs> and they try to stop us from doing that. Um, but we're also a very resourceful crowd. And we're very strong because we don't acknowledge differences between community or between, uh, between countries and continents and languages, we just work across them. And um, I'm pretty confident we can break this. I'm pretty confident that in five years' time, the patent system will be shaking its foundations. And I hope that in 10 years' time, we've brought it down from its current form. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I suck at predicting the future, but hey, it's worth a shot. Um, And if I'm five years too late for that, I, don't, I won't be very sorry. Anyway, uh, so that's one thing. So far we've talked about the, uh, the computer, the device. Let's uh, move up the stack. Let's uh, go to the network level. And that's where I get to use my next slide. Um, <coughs> we've built many systems that <clears throat> actually look like this. We build systems that don't have a central point of control. Um, and nobody can, this, this system, right, it has no off switch. It's how the internet, it's the architecture of the internet. Uh, to get, in order to get from here to here, you can go any number of different ways. I can't stop you. And um, there are many, it's not just the internet that works like this. It's, uh, it's email, it's chat, it's World Wide Web, it's voice over IP calls. They all mostly work in this very distributed fashion. And we can only build all these systems um, because we had general purpose computers and stupid networks that didn't care what we did with them. And so we said, we have this great new idea. The network wasn't really designed for that, but I think we can make phone calls work with the internet. And then we did. Um, but this end-to-end -end principle in the network and the general purpose nature of computers, they are not in any way the natural state of thing, right? These are devices and systems created by humans, and someone took a conscious design decision to build them that way. And it's a very good decision, it's a very smart decision, very um, broad. Insightful. That word doesn't exist in English, does it? Anyway, <laughs> very, very far-sighted. Forward-thinking. Uh, forward yeah, looking looking forward toward thinking. the future. Yeah, forward-thinking. Forward-thinking, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, 
but it's still a human decision. And as such, it can be reversed. There's no reason why it needs to be that way. And in fact, some people have reversed it. Because they've come um, on top of our distributed systems. They've built architectures of control that look like this. Where you have, basically, if this is me, uh, no, sorry. If this is you, and this is me, and you want to talk to me, you have to go through Mark Zuckerberg. This is him here in the middle. Um, and if you want to find, if you want to find my website up here, then you have to go through Google servers. That is how these systems, these architectures of control work. And that means that the situation we have today is that Facebook defines who we are. And Amazon defines what we want. And Google defines what we think. Facebook defines who we are because we, as we are social creatures. And it has all our friends. And it owns our network of friends. <laughs> Amazon defines what we want because they have this amazing recommendation system that just knows everything you want and shows you all this stuff that's probably very interesting to you, too. And yes, it works really well. I use it a lot. Um, and Google defines what we think, because it ranks the search results. And what's not on Google doesn't exist for all intents and purposes. And so not only does it put us in a bubble, it also, um, it also should sort of tells us what to, what to think first, what to look at first. And since we all have limited time available, we only look at the stuff on the first page. And these companies have a lot of data on us, and they will sell us out whenever it's in their interest to do so. Um, when the Iranian government came to Yahoo saying, we have these pesky voters, and they say nasty things about the government, then Yahoo said, well, tough luck, because free speech. And then the government said, are you interested in continuing to operate in this country? And Yahoo said, if you put it that way, here you go. <laughs> um, but that only happens in dictatorships. No. So a few months ago, we got this thing in, I mean, there's probably any number of incidents, but a few months ago, there was um, a judge in New York, uh, and he told Twitter to release information on people who have participated in the Occupy Wall Street movement, and released their tweets and their IP addresses and um, replies and all that. And um, Twitter said, no, 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 because free speech. And the judge said, well, uh, we still need that information. So, but if you're not willing to hand it over this alternative, you can pay a fine. And that fine will be calculated as a share of your earnings. Now, Twitter doesn't like to disclose its earnings because it's still venture capital funding, basically. And um, they didn't want their earnings to go on the court record and become public documents. So they said, ah, mm -hmm. well, ah, you know what? Ah, here you go. Um, that means Twitter had to choose at this point between loyalty to its users and loyalty to its owners and investors. And we all, we all can see, or we, we, it's, it's easy to predict how that choice will go. Um, because that's just, and it's not, just, it's not that Twitter is an inherently evil company. It's just that the way, this is the way the system is set up. And if you commit to an, if you participate in an architecture like this, in a system that's built like this, then that's the deal you're going in for, right? You can leave Facebook, but you leave Facebook on the same terms that dissidents left the Soviet Union. No, really, you leave behind your friends, you leave behind your family, you leave behind everything you've built. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be that way. Because we can make it be different. We can make it be like this. Uh, we can build decentralized and distributed networks. We can put a server in every house. Just uh, earlier this week, I spoke to VDL Garvey, once Debian HP. Now he runs something called Freedom Box Project um, for Evan Moglin. And um, I hear there are some very interesting developments and some things that are moving forward. So I hopefully we'll have some easy way to install, to put a server in every house pretty soon. That isn't hard to administer and doesn't require a lot of resources. Um, we have the hardware. 
you can you don't have to wait for any specific hardware you take uh, it's one of these small plug computers or a Raspberry Pi or an old laptop or something we have all the software we just need to make it work together and um, then we can take charge of these systems ourselves and we can build our own because the centralized architecture is really just a replay of the mainframe era it's when you had a terminal on your desk and you would log into this powerful computer far, far away. Sound familiar? Like Gmail, for example? Um, this point was made to me by <laughs> Vint Cerf, the guy with the transmission control protocol. And I sat next to him at a workshop uh, in the Internet Governance Forum two years ago. And he said, he, I gave him this thing about distributed systems, an earlier version of what I just said now. And then the moderator asked him, well, Vint, what do you think of that? And it was like, well, he's a very kindly gentleman now. Well, um, we have to distinguish between visions and hallucinations. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I agree that we do. So we have these social networks like Diaspora and Google Social and Appleseed and Friend for Friend and a ton of other projects that I probably haven't even heard of. And they all work to varying degrees. We have these protocols like OStatus and Webfinger and Federated Social Web. And we have these tools like um, OwnCloud and GNUnet that let us uh, make it easy for us to store files on servers. Um, we have, it's not just software, we have user-owned internet service providers. We have a currency like Bitcoin um, for all its, its drawbacks and has benefits. We have, um, we have free search engine like Yacy, Y-A-C-Y, which can a free distributed search engine that you can install locally. And at the moment, what it does is deliver its results for, uh, for computer science happen to be just a lot better than the rest. I to just uh, warn you. But that's how Wikipedia was in the early days, right? Um, and all these tools exist. William Gibson says, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Many of us are already using these tools. And um, the rest of us can too. So, we really have that choice, to which future we want, and then we, can, we have the, the tools to go and build it. And a few of the things we need to do is to um, demand devices that we can own. That means buying devices that we can own and not buying devices that we cannot own and that we cannot control. Um, it means creating and distributing and demanding free content. Books, movies, movie, uh, music, yeah? Cutting in a little bit, you said before that you don't need to buy the specific hardware for the Freedom Box project. Now, I would add, yes, you do, because you need to buy the open hardware boxes. This is actually popping up and being real now, because you want to own the devices. Well, I didn't say you don't need to buy any new device, or you shouldn't buy any new no, device. No, you just, when you buy a device, make sure it's one you can own. Yeah. And um, when, you, when you start using a web service or a system that's on the internet connect, to connect you with others. Make sure it looks like this and not like this. One important thing to do, because we all, we all know these things aren't yet, uh, they're rough around the edges, so, and many things need to be built still. So what we need for that is mainly skills. Skill, learning about technology um, and learning how to control our technology is the one, and teaching others about it, is the one crucial thing that we have to do to make sure we, we live in freedom in the future. Uh, if we teach our colleagues and our friends and our children, if we teach them now on how to program, on how to understand all these machines, then um, they will take care of this for us and help us with this task. There's, uh, there's this one guy, Douglas Rushkoff, who uh, a technology writer, basically, and he says, if we learn how to direct technology, we gain access to the switchboard of civilization. If we choose to let ourselves be directed by technology, it will be the last decision, or it may be the last decision we ever make. <laughs> so the question is always, who controls this device? Who controls this network? I would like to introduce you to a gentleman. Um, an elderly gentleman who, as far as I'm informed, knows nothing about computers. Uh, there's a fax machine in his office, but that's as far as it goes. 
<coughs> his name is Gene Sharp. And he runs a thing called the Albert Einstein Institute somewhere near New York. And he's a very dangerous man. If you're from Iran or from China or Zimbabwe, and you attend one of the courses of his institute, it's quite likely that when you go back home, you will be arrested. It's quite likely that when you go back home, you will be put under surveillance, because surveillance protects not us, it protects the status quo. Because what this man has done, or continues to do, he has written a lot of books. And those books are basically, one of the, ti one, one of the, the more famous ones is titled From Dictatorship to Democracy. They're basically manuals for regime change by the people for the people. Um, uh, the students who overthrew Milosevic in Serbia were using his books as instructions. The color revolutions in Eastern Europe were using his books as instructions. And um, people, the people who participated in the Serbian revolution are now teaching others to act on these instructions. Civil disobedience, a ton of other things you can do to bring down dictators. And his key message is that power resides in the consent given by people in society. Mm. We can only be controlled if we agree to be controlled. Mm. And we can start to disagree from being controlled. And that comes with a price. If you live in China, that price might be high. If you, because, um, well, the government would like that. Um, but we can, we can just withhold the consent. In theory, it's always possible to withhold your consent. But this, now we're not talking about, here we're not talking about dictatorships, really, or at least not in the usual sense. What we're talking about is control by technology companies that we have voluntarily submitted to, and we can just as voluntarily walk away. Um, we can withhold our consent, and we can take the power back. And yes, there will be sacrifices. It means that things get a bit inconvenient sometimes. But nobody asks you to risk, risk beatings and arrests. Nobody asks you to risk torture. Nobody asks you just to go and stand in front of the tank. You just sort of find other ways to invite your friends for a beer than Facebook. Um, it's not really that hard. Come on. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's help us build that future. Let's do it together. Um, Please support FSFE because that's what we help with. We go and educate people. We go and keep politicians from making bad laws, and we help them make good ones. And um, yeah, we can really support for that. Thank you. Well. Question. Yes. But you really do believe that the transformation of technology is possible without the uh, transformation of society at large? Well, because let me put it the other way around. Uh, if we wait for society to be transformed until we transform technology, we'll be like so totally screwed in a few years' time. We have to start somewhere. Technology is, to us in this room and in, these, in this scene and this community, is what's accessible to us. But we but let's, start, uh, we let's start with technology and let uh, let's start with laws, because laws are accessible to us in some way as well. We can lobby, we can exercise pressure, um, and we don't need billions of dollars for that. Um, so this is what we can do here today, and back home next week, and it's already making an impact. So um, why not start there? Yeah, I'm just cu curious about something. Uh, I was a bit involved uh, long ago, and I, it sort of died completely, and I don't know if it has rebuilt itself into something. There was uh, a thing called Trusted Computing, and mm -hmm. there was a site, Anti-TCPA, that this, uh, got hundreds uh, of right. thousands of signatures, and uh, suddenly that site <coughs> is gone, and uh, you don't hear a lot about Trusted Computing anymore. So what's That's happened with that? Because uh, it was basically... Um, a lot of that effort has been redirected into creating a restricted boot, mm -hmm. uh, and we feed. So that that's sort of where this whole freight train went. Mm -hmm. um, I completely agree with everything you said. That's mm -hmm. nice to hear. Thank you. <laughs> but it's not very creative. That's, that's the problem you're preaching to the members. Everyone is on board with it. But the problem. 
problem I see with this patient. Everyone wants to uh, to have access to the paper. Everyone wants everyone to use PDP and so on. But the problem is, I think it's actually like Corey Doctor was saying this in the in the CCC talk that the problem with Facebook is not that uh, the problem is people want to use these kinds of tools, and we have to convey the failure modes of these tools. But usually it doesn't really fail for most people. So I think actually. And you know what? Yeah. Let's make it interesting because I disagree. Um, what I think we need, because it's going to be very hard to find a few billion dollars to blow out the window in order to come up with a smoother Facebook. Um, and it might not be the best, the best way to use those resources. Now you're just going to heckle me, Manila. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no. So Corey's right when he says we have to convey the failure modes and the way in which Facebook fails is that it fails every single one of us, if you use it, in terms of privacy, in terms of being in charge of our lives. It's taking away from us who we are. And that is what we have to convey. Um, yes, I know I'm preaching to the converted, which is kind of nice, because uh, <laughs> it's easier than preaching to the non-converted. But no, but I hope, seriously, what I hope to do with this is to give all of you the arguments that when you go home, back home tomorrow or on Monday, um, that you can tell others about these things. And I've put a lot of work into making them easy to transport, and maybe that's what helps. Uh, it seems like most uh, programmers for open source uh, software today are struggling with a lot of power. Uh, so they put uh, a lot of energy in like, lighting drivers to get the devices working. And uh, the devices are broken by design and Is anyone here speaking about the Jolla project at some point? Because I'd love to hear about that. Um, it's not, um, anyway, uh, I, I don't know how it fits with our context exactly. <coughs> so yes, someone should go and do that. And, um, but we've already seen that in OpenOco, and it's really hard. OpenOco was done by people who knew their stuff, and it didn't go so well. Um, that doesn't mean it can't go better next time, but it's, it's kind of hard. But we're, on the other hand, when we put effort into freeing devices like free or Android, um, we're actually doing several things at once. We're doing, yes, we're freeing devices. We're ripping them from Google's claws. Um, what we're also doing is putting free software in the hands of people who didn't have it before. Because interestingly enough, people who come to our workshops oftentimes are not actually what you call techies normally. They're people who are concerned about their privacy. Um, these are not people who's, who would wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to replace the operating system on this horribly expensive mobile phone I bought, and maybe brick it in the process. Um, they just say, I want to make sure my contacts are safe and my messages are safe. And then they come to us and we help them do that, and they walk out of these workshops saying, hey, wow, I just the, changed the operating system on this phone? So I can do all sorts of other things too? Wow, it's not that hard, cool. And you have a new member of the free software community. So that's another thing we do with our campaign, what makes it so valuable. Okay. Um, two things. Um, I think there's a lot of energy around uh, creating a top to bottom free software and hardware stack in the KDE community with the products and stuff that you're doing. So if you're like, why well, all this hardware knowledge, more money to throw at someone's <coughs> uh, that's one place you could take it. And then second, um, Alternatives slick. I don't know that they can be slick 
The Media Goblin campaign ended yesterday, right? Yeah, it was for kid money. Nice stickers with people on it. All right, so you want you want to help Media Goblin go talk to Dev? <laughs> Say all we do is build social networks because that was what someone centralized came up with in a centralized fashion. Yeah, and that is also that was what became the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the next thing that the centralizers will try to do? Was it seen a threat to what, what is the next step that they will succeed in how to the software community if you take the time. they start in that project? No. But I you know, if I, if I knew uh, that, I'd be on the phone with my investment banker right now. Right now. <laughs> yeah, but we're supposed to close it. Yeah, no, it's well, like secure, you well, just not have the next day because so those devices are on the market. Yeah, um, next time, stop them. Yes. Well, succeeding, okay, sure. there is another one. the free software community next is finding yeah, ways of working one. around that, um, around secure boot. But yes, it's a problem, it's a threat, and it's a huge annoyance in every way. Uh, as for the next threat, I'll try to think of something, but at this point, I can't really tell you. I'll know when I see Secret. Um, I wanted to respond a little bit to what Deb said and the point about alternate social networks needing to be really slick. We have another strategy. We can look at what the current centralized social networks are doing and what they won't do. There are certain things they won't do because they don't want to lose their revenue streams or ag aggravate like the, um, they don't want to aggravate Hollywood, for example. That's why you can't share movies on Facebook. You can on Beacon Yeah. Which is the Russian page. Well, there you go, they don't care about Hollywood. But if we think about things this way, we can identify features that we could be adding to these decentralized free platforms that will allow us to provide value that the centralized guys will never be able to provide. You know, the, you, you talked about voice over IP. That's something that a freed Android should come with. You know, we should be giving people low IP when we free their Androids, you know, if we have the apps, that sort of thing. So, just a general strategy point. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just want to raise a little flag for tomorrow's presentation on Yabasta, who's going to continue this discussion about how uh, you could make social networking uh, in, an, in an encrypted way and uh, decentralized. And when and where is that? Um, uh, 16 something, I think. <laughs> okay. Tomorrow. <laughs> Any of you directly, do you, does anybody have better info on when the talk is? Yeah. 16, 15 and room 4. Okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Your turn then? Yeah, uh, it seems like most uh, ordinary people who are not geeks, they tend to use things that people put in their hands. And uh, I think the big problem with uh, almost every open software today is that you actually have to install it on the device. So we, if we could get, for example, mobile phones running uh, by on a gen mod in yeah. the beginning, and uh, with an app that says PS4 instead of Facebook, that would probably be easier than to go yeah. tell everybody to use another device, another thing instead. Okay, good point. Otto? Yeah, I just want to have a reaction to this and what Dev said. I was going to ask you again, how many of you own a laptop? <laughs> and how many of you bought your laptop with Linux pre-installed? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I think this is a really big problem. People, you must spend the extra 200 euros or something. For example, even, even at this conference, there's Gigi, GGS Data as one of the sponsors and they sell free install Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the only way you are going to affect because the whole stack starts from the hardware. So we need to have open hardware. And the only way to get open hardware is to buy 50,000 of them from the Chinese factory. And the only way to but that's basically a product sample for yeah. Foxconn or something. And, and to buy, okay, well, to, to start by, by that, they are not interested in discussing it with you with, with, with figures lower than that. And the only way for anybody to, to get to that level is to have customers. And we have to support these, all of these companies like Saris and, and, and you name it. There's lots of hardware available. Back. I, I think that maybe we're trying to come at this whole problem backwards. You mentioned uh, 
On the other hand, then the problem is that I mean, it's, it's basically a privacy issue, right? And um, uh, if you look at the people using Facebook, that's a fairly good indicator of how many people don't give a flying shit about privacy. Yes. <laughs> my, 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 my point is that my point is that you want to find the people who get started outside the. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's really, I guess what, what this really comes down to is for whichever, whichever angle you're personally taking on the free software and freedom in the technology world, um, take that angle and find people who will join you and work together with you on it. Um, you've been waiting for a while. Yes. Uh, about the advertising, uh, tomorrow, though, at 12 o'clock, Freedom Talk talk. It's you doing that? Yes. Very good. Um, in the back? Can you speak up a bit? Hello? I guess the pre-installed Linux is as good and as bad as pre-installed Android. So it does not give any guarantees against a locked-in device with Linux on. It's very mm, okay. easy to lock in a Linux image with a trusted stick the boot and so on. Okay. Select the company and read like about That's the company. Thing. Well, it does, but at the moment the problem is that people don't do this. People go to Giganti in Sweden or whatever and buy the cheapest possible device, mm -hmm. and then they get everything with that. We have the last question. Last question. Um, because that would take people getting nervous. Uh, well. Bernard. Oh, oh, <laughs> is it a response to what I uh, It's uh, only a few years ago. Uh, we had this area of the netbooks, and the cheap netbooks were those used running li Linux. And we had them for a couple of months, uh, again, for half a year, or maybe maybe a year, the cheapest. Um, but the uh, developers of mobile uh, uh, software just realized that they need to do something about this. Um, they offered them cheaper software and, of course, better software than what we have. Because one problem we all have is that we like to hack on, on this stuff, but we don't like to work on a real product. That was one of the problems of open, of open mobile. That is a fun in hacking, but it's not fun to really work on the last 5% of this, what we later call a product. Yeah. And that is, that's a, that's a real, real problem why we are all hackers and don't like to do it. Okay. I must I respond on this because- <laughs> Can you, would you mind to, very much responding to, over coffee? To us is easy <laughs> and which was really successful until Microsoft got angry and then they gave them XP licenses for like really mm -hmm. cheaply and then they... I mean Microsoft the will always price us out of the market yeah. if they the choose. The problem is that Microsoft is so, is so power, powerful and there's no alternative who, who is the customer for the, for the factories in China. Mm -hmm. We need to have somebody who is okay. the customer than Microsoft. Good, thank, thank you, you very all much. very much. We have our challenge.